for you guys. If you have a question, put your question in the chat and you don't have to put the question. Just say, I have a question. Kathy will team me up and you will uh, ask your question directly to somebody who has become, believe it or not, you are our uh, most uh, requested and most, uh, you've been on more than anybody else. I think you, this is your like third or fourth appearance uh, in this series. So we are incredibly blessed to have Laura Gastner Odding, uh, but throw that out the window. She's LGO <laughs> to everybody uh, with us. She's the best-selling author of one of my favorite books of all time, Limitless, uh, incredible book. We're gonna be talking about her new book, which is not out yet called Wonder Hell. She's one of the world's top speakers. Uh, she helped form AmeriCorps uh, under the Bill Clinton administration. She's the former CEO of a wildly successful executive search firm. You've seen her maybe on the Today Show or Good Morning America. Uh, she is a badass. Uh, so I am very, very excited uh, for us to dive in with LGO. But before we do that, Kathy, get us started. A huge thank you to Mike Perlo for putting that incredible intro together. LGO, is that an intro or what? I mean, that is an intro. Holy shit. Damn. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. And so many great people that you've had. Wow. Thank you. Uh, it, it's a lot of them introductions from you or people that you are uh, buddies with. So I'm incredibly excited uh, to dive in. And unlike uh, most times where I have a million questions because I've read the book, I haven't read the book because it's not out yet. So it's not out yet. Um, it's, that's exciting. So I'm gonna start with the, what was the inspiration? So I know that this concept of wonder hell goes back, I think a few years. Yeah, um, it does. Yeah. Tell tell us a little bit about the inspiration for the book. Okay, so in April of 2019, Limitless came out as you mentioned, and uh I had just started my speaking career. I was uh at an event in Vancouver where I there were there were five speakers. It uh was Tiffany Bova, Tiffany Duhu, uh, uh Tasha Yurik, um Emily Chang, and then Malala, like Malala, Malala, right? Yeah. And yeah, whatever, naturally, of course, I opened for Malala. Cool, right? That was like my second or third keynote of my entire life. So in 2016, I had sold my executive search firm and I got asked to do a TEDx talk. And that TEDx talk got some attention and I started getting offered money for speaking. And I didn't even know this was a job. And so fast forward to 2019, I was like, I did some training. I put myself out there. I'm like, I'm going to do it. And I ended up on the stage with Malala. Well, the event was Friday afternoon and my goddaughter's bat mitzvah was Saturday morning. So like can't miss Malala, can't miss my goddaughter's bat mitzvah. So I'm on the red eye. And I mean, I'm kind of too old for that shit. But there I was on the red eye, having a very, very difficult time trying to fall asleep. So at 4.30 in the morning, I, I pull out my laptop and I'm like, screw it. I'm just going to like surf Facebook. And I had this 
I had this feeling where I was like, you know, the book came out, it launched as a Washington Post bestseller, like number two, right behind Michelle Obama. I was on the Today Show, amazing, crazy. I didn't expect that. Like I expected three people to buy my book and they'd be like my mother, my father, and maybe my sister possibly buying it used from my mom. <laughs> but suddenly there I was and I was like, oh, it worked. I did it. Amazing, exciting, wonderful. But there I was on this red eye and I was exhausted and it was 4.30 a.m. And I remember typing out a Facebook post like, it's 4.30 a.m. Maybe it's 7.30 a.m. Or maybe it's 1.30 a.m. I have no idea. But somewhere between the blur that was yesterday and the blur that will be tomorrow is the space I'm in right now. And that space I'm in right now is not upright and locked in a center seat flying on this red eye between two giant former linebackers. It's actually wonder hell. Because it's amazing, it's exciting, it's humbling that this thing actually worked, this thing I had no idea that I could even do. And at the same time, in that moment, I also saw this version of my potential. I was like, well, I was on the Today Show. What about Good Morning America? What about Under the Oak Tree with Oprah? She got to talk to someone. Why not me? And I had this moment where I was like, oh, ooh, is that okay? Am I allowed to be that ambitious? Am I allowed to have those dreams? I'm not really sure. Is it for me? So I was in this moment where it was exciting and amazing and wonderful, but also the burden of that potential plopped itself on my shoulders and was like, hey, Laura, what you got for me? Are you going to live into this newfound you that you didn't even know existed last week, last month, last year? Or are you going to let it pass you by? And so I wasn't in that center seat locked upright between those linebackers. I was actually in wonder hell. It was amazing. It was exciting. It was humbling. It was wonderful. But it was also anxiety provoking and stressful and identity questioning. It was hell. It was wonder hell. And so I wrote this like screed on Facebook and I posted it. And within like five minutes, like a hundred people liked it and commented on it and shared it. And uh, three dear friends of mine, one said, not for nothing, but that's a great word. Another one said, just so you know, wonderhell.com is available for 99 cents on GoDaddy and maybe you should pick up the URL. And my publisher for Limitless said, I just got to say that would make a great title for your next book. So I did nothing with it for a year and then the pandemic happened and I was still in this place of like, I know there's more in me and I want to go for it, but it's also really stressful. But who are you going to complain to? And you're like, things are great. Oh no, right? Like, what is that feeling? And so I just started talking to a ton of different people. I mean, I talked to a hundred glass ceiling shatterers and Olympic medalists and startup unicorns. And some of them you've had on the show, Kara Golden, Jackie Summers, Amberly Lago, right? I've had these conversations with incredible humans. And what I learned from them is that each one of them at every age and every stage still has crushing imposter syndrome and vulnerability and uncertainty and doubt and exhaustion and maybe burnout. Because we are told that as soon as you get to success, everything's going to be great. It's going to be amazing. Yay, you're done. But it turns out that every wonder hell, every success isn't a finite destination. It's not an end point, but it's a waypoint into how much more we can be. So every wonder hell on the other side of this one is just the next one and the next one and the next one. So I wrote the book with lessons from all of these people and, of course, weaving in my own story um, to help people understand that it's not about surviving these moments of wonder hell, but actually learning to look forward to them and plan for them and learn from them and actually thrive in them instead. So because we, this is the first time I think we've ever not had the book available to read. It comes so, out on April 4th. I'm so sorry. I know. So, <laughs> But you can pre-order it now. <laughs> so here's what I'd like to do. This is like a trailer to a movie. Uh, you know, I, wanna, I want you to walk us through the book a bit, uh, giving us kind of the highlights uh, but just like a trailer to a movie, you're like, oh, damn, I got to watch I got to watch that movie. So don't yes. give away all the secrets, but kind of walk us through um, what are people going to take away when they order Wonder Hell on Amazon and you write a five star review, uh, which is a must. Um, what, tell, tell us a little bit about what are people going to take away? So the book is a little cheeky. 
Um, first of all, you can watch the TEDx. That's shocking, LGO. <laughs> what do you mean? What? Um, I know. It's like, it's very funny because I, I, I sent what I thought was the penultimate version of my publisher. And he's like, okay, well, we'll send it out to our editor and send it back to you. And the editor um, really took basically all the LGO out of the book. And I was like, no, no, you don't understand. Like my, like, I'm not writing a dry business book. I'm writing a book that actually people will be like, oh my God, I can relate to that story. Like it's funny, it's enjoyable. Um, so uh, I will say two things. The first is uh, I did a TEDx talk on it that's on TED.com and it's like 990,006, I don't know, 909, uh, it's 4,000 away from being a million views. All right. Uh, we'll, so, we'll get you 600 closer. We have so you can numbers, watch so. that. That's a 12 minute overview. But here's what I'll say. This is the cover of the book. And as you can see, it's got a roller coaster that's there, right? The, the book is called Wonder Hell, Why Success Doesn't Feel Like It Should and What to Do About It. Um, it's got a great blurb by Mel Robbins on the front cover, which is incredible. Um, but here's the thing. We all think success is going to be fun. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be great. We can't wait to get there. And then one day I realized, you know, I also felt the way about amusement parks. Like you think it's going to be super fun. You're going to get there. It's going to be awesome. And then you're there and it's like three o'clock in the afternoon and you're kind of hot and sweaty and maybe you smell a little bit and you're a little sunburned and the corn dog in your stomach is sort of threatening to make its way somewhere else. And you're standing in line for a ride you have no interest in going on. And you're like, I thought this was going to be fun. Why isn't this fun? And when you're at the amusement park, you can choose to go to different towns at different times. You can go wherever you want to go. It's a sort of a choose your own adventure. I was like, you know what? That sounds very familiar. So Wonder Hell is sort of based in this idea of an amusement park. So inside you'll see there's this great map my and God, it's I separated it. into, so, so the, the, the introduction is called the information desk. And then you go through three towns, Imposter Town, Doubtsville, and Burnout City. And at the end of the book, there's um, there's the souvenir shop, which is the conclusion. And then the acknowledgement is overflow parking. That was my husband's <laughs> idea, <laughs> which I thought was pretty cute. But here's the thing. We have, every time we achieve something, we have the tsunami of emotions that come at us. There's pride, there's excitement, there's uncertainty, there's imposter syndrome, there's this feeling that maybe we could be bigger, there's the bumper cars that are throwing us off course. So in each of the three towns, Imposter Town, Doubtsville, and Burnout City, there are five rides, and each ride represents one of those emotions that you go through. So you could go in and you could be like, you know, everything feels great, but you know, I'm just, maybe I don't want to keep growing bigger. And maybe this is the time to just stay where I am and really like invest in my family. Well, then you're on the merry-go-round. Or maybe you're like, everything seems like it's terrific, but I just had these people in my life that every time I go up and I look down to this new perspective, they, they, I don't want to, I don't want to keep bringing them with me. Maybe I need to say goodbye. Well, that's the Ferris wheel. So all throughout the book, there's, it's sort of fun because there's, there, there are all these different all these different um, rides that are in the book. And so any, each, any teacups, you know, I don't have, I have a scrambler, no the scrambler is, right. you know, when I'm you're like curious. trying to find your way and you're so confused and you just don't know what to do next. And so in each one of the chapters, I also tell stories, a couple of stories, and then a little bit of mine from each of the, um, the people that I interviewed. <laughs> Imposter syndrome is so prevalent. Um, yes. And, you know, I think having the good fortune of really developing phenomenal relationships with people like you or a Heather Monahan or like you name it. She's uh, in the Jesse book too. Sorry, everyone <laughs> thinks that everyone thinks they these people landed on the top of the mountain and they forget about the climb and they think they have all this confidence in the world. And I think one of the cool things about getting to know people that have performed at a high level. Like we've got Joe Jacoby uh, on this call right now. He's an Olympic gold medalist. I guarantee that Joe uh, at some point was like, wait a second, what am I doing here? Like, you know, everyone has that imposter syndrome. What's the best way for people to deal with, with that very, very common phenomenon? Yeah, I mean, it's super common. And, you know, I, I, I'd love it if Joe wanted to speak to this also. I, I did interview some Olympic medalists in the book as well. And one of the things that I asked them was like, what do you think about when you're like at the starting line or when you're like at the top of the mountain or you're about to go? And um, 
I was shocked that the answer was nothing. Like we think about nothing because you, you almost to a one, they said something along the lines of you, you earn your medals in practice. You just pick them up on race day. And I thought that that was super interesting as somebody who's, you know, an athlete myself, although obviously not at Joe's level. um, I know that when I'm sitting about to start a, a, a regatta, about to start a rowing race, I know that there's nothing I can do at that point other than just execute the plan. And so uh, a lot of the people I talked to, they got over the imposter syndrome um, by doing a couple of things. Uh, The first is they reminded themselves that they did the work, right? They put the work in and what got them to the starting line was actually enough to get them to the starting line. And then all it is is about just delivering on the things that they already know, number one. Number two, uh, uh, they saw it as not finite, right? So it's not, I'm here and whatever happens, this is it, but this is just a chance to grow and to change and to keep going. So a lot of our, a lot of our <clears throat> imposter syndrome comes either from being in a place where there is a uh, uh, that we're that we're working in a system that wasn't built for us, right? So we may be the first of, we may be the only, um, and that could be, you know, for women, for people of color, for the the members of the queer community, or it could be for straight white dudes who are walking in and they just haven't had somebody in that role before. Like it could be anybody, right? It could be anybody who was who was um, the first of or trying to change something, and we feel like an imposter because, of course, we are an imposter we haven't been there before. They may not be necessarily welcoming us, but isn't that kind of exciting that we're in a place we never expected to be? Seth Godin likes to talk about it as every time you get to the next rung of the ladder, like that's exciting. You haven't been there before, but it's also scary. And so of course you're an imposter. We should welcome those moments of being an imposter because it shows us that we've grown past what we thought we could do. And then the the, the, the last thing that they do is, is they change the interpretation of the voice. So old cars used to be made with this thing called a governor that would literally stop the driver from doing something stupid. You can't push the pedal all the way down and go 150 miles an hour. The governor in the engine only allows enough juice in the, in, in the car to get to 110. Like it literally stops us from going too fast, being, you know, unsafe and literally burning, <clears throat> burning out the engine. We have that same governor in our head who every time we go somewhere that we haven't gone before, we're not really sure, gives us this 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 warning like, oh my God, you haven't done this before. When really we should be listening to that voice and changing the way we interpret it into a cheerleader, cheerleader that says, oh my God, you haven't done this before. And isn't it amazing if we can change the voice from stop, don't do this to isn't this incredible, what an opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. It's so interesting because I think sometimes we think of success as like a finite point in time. And like, once you get there and, and, and I think (laughs) what you realize is that you never kind of get there. So you better enjoy the journey along the way and, and all the different steps. And I don't know why I was thinking when you were talking about this, there was a couple of things that were popping into my head and I think they make sense. Maybe, maybe they don't. Um, the one was, you know, kind of be careful what you wish for. Um, and two things came to mind and it's weird because literally my wife and I, Meg and I were talking this morning about struggle and like, we were talking, uh, we were on a walk the other day and we were talking about the beater cars that we drove when we were in high school. Uh, you know, and now like kids are getting like brand new Range Rovers driving them to high school, which is like it kind of takes the fun out of when you get to a level of success where you can afford that stuff. Like you don't enjoy it as much. I remember the first time in my career where I kind of, I I was doing well financially and I'm like, you know, I don't really have to save up. Like if I want something within reason and I don't have like crazy, like I don't want to drive a Bentley or anything like that, but within reason, like if I wanted a new TV, I'd go buy a new TV. And I found like, it wasn't as fun. Uh, I'm like, I can kind of, I can kind of do these things. Um, the other thing I thought of is, and this is good for parents. Uh, I lobbied when I was a little kid, I was like seven years old and I was frustrated because of, uh, mother's day and father's day. I'm like, what about like kids day? There should be a kid's day. (laughs) So I lobbied, my parents for a kid's day. So they're like, okay, uh, 
you can pick one day a year and it will be your own day. Now you can't like, you know, be somewhere we don't know where you are, but you can, if you want to watch TV all day, you can watch TV all day. If you want to eat Doritos all day, you can eat Doritos all day. You, you do anything you want. It's your day. And we were all fired up about it. And I remember after doing it like the first two years, I'm like, it's not like all it's cracked up to be. Like getting everything you want is not all it's cracked up to be. And I don't know if that relates to kind of wonder hell in the book, but those are just some of the things that popped into my head. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of like, be careful what you wish for that's in there. I, I, you know, I, there, the thing about the, about the, about the kids day, I think that's hilarious. Cause if my kids said to me, like, what about a kid's day? I'd be like, those are the other 363 <laughs> days a year. Oh, wait, you have a birthday. So it's the other 362 days a year. Um, but, uh, I, there's this thing called the hedonic treadmill where every time we get something, we we get used to having that thing. So we just want the next thing and the next Wait, thing. What's and it called? The hedonic treadmill, like hedonism, the hedonic treadmill. Gosh. And so if you're running on the treadmill and along the way, you're like picking up all the things, well, you don't actually, number one, you don't take time to stop and enjoy them. And number two, you have, you know, you have the, the the nice car in your garage. Now you want the nicer car, right? You join the fancy uh, country club. And when you're at the fancy country club, all you're thinking about is, well, who's across the street at the fancier country club? And so what happens is you end up actually working so hard to get the bigger and the more and the better and the faster that you actually don't end up enjoying any of the stuff that you actually have. And so I think the the idea behind, you know, I, there's a lot of hustle porn out there, right? Like keep going, no, it's the grindstone 10 X, right? Lean in and all of that. And, 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 you know, as I wrote in limitless, I think that that's very damaging because it, it forces us to try to fill in all the boxes that belong on somebody else's definition of success. And so even when all those boxes are full, we still pr feel pretty empty. You're like, yeah, I'm sitting on the couch eating Doritos and watching TV all day. Great. But now what? Like, there's only so long that that's enjoyable. So I do, I do think that there's, there's a little, um, there's a little piece to that. I do see we have a question from Scott. I want to make sure. I'm happy to just take questions yeah, throughout gonna, if you want to go. We're we're gonna load them all up. Okay. Um, hedonic treadmill. I think everyone's homework assignment. Use that today in a sentence in a conversation. You will instantly sound really smart. <laughs> Like, super Wait, smart. can I can I give you can I give you another another uh, really super smart thing that I learned oh, yeah. um, from Amy Cuddy actually uh, when I was talking about an imposter syndrome I was like well I don't know it seems like everybody else knows what they're doing and she's like oh well that just leads to pluralistic ignorance okay Plural. pluralistic Plural. ignorance. ignorance. That means that if I walk into a room that I feel like I don't belong in and I puff up my chest and I swell up my ego and I'm like, oh, then you see that and you're like, well, Laura knows what she's doing. Well, if LGO's got it together, I better act like I got it together. So you puff up your chest and you breathe out like you know what you're doing. And so then I see you do that and I'm like, oh, well, I better puff up my chest even more. And neither one of us will admit that the other one, like neither one of us will admit that we, that we actually feel like we don't belong. We have this insecurity. So instead we just have this like, you know, mutually escalating warfare of faking it till we make it. And then neither one of us actually make it. And we also don't connect with each other. So rather than having pluralistic ignorance where we both are ignorant to what's happening inside of the other person, we could just like, be okay saying, you know, I don't know the answer to that. What do you think? And then you have yeah. a real conversation. Love it. See how smart we're all going to be <laughs> after just this one hour. It's unbelievable. Um, so last question, because we have a bunch of people that want to ask you questions. Um, when in your life, and it could have been when you were a kid, when did you kind of realize that you were an outlier, that you're a little bit different from everybody else? Well, I went to computer sleepaway camp when I was 13 years old. So that was pretty different. Nice. <laughs> when I was 13 years old, I spent the summer in the Poconos in New York, learning how to program uh, BASIC and Fortran and COBOL on, wait, wait for it, Atari computers. So yeah. You, you can geek out with uh, Pierre DuPont afterwards, because I think that Pierre, like when he graduated from Princeton, I think that's kind of somewhat what you did, but. Yeah, yeah um, it is, uh, it is, it is, 
I had a, I had an older sister who was 16 months older than I was, who was uh, absolutely stunning from the moment she came out of the womb, like never had an awkward day in her life. I don't even think she ever had a pimple. I think she wore braces for like four months, whereas I had like pre-braces and then braces. And I was, you know, so I was like worth my weight in Commodore. Yeah. I see Thomas saying Atari Commodore 64 in television. Yes. And I remember we were like, what's this Apple? What Macintosh? What? That's ridiculous. That's, those aren't real computers. Like shows you what I know. Um, so, so, um, uh, in comparison to her, I always felt like awkward and uncomfortable. And like, I just didn't belong on my own skin until, and there's a chapter on this in the book, it's the tent of oddities, right? Like fly your freak flag. We can all like, it turns out that what's compelling to other people about us. I mean, all of you are in the relationship business, whatever business you're in, we're all in the relationship business. I mean, you know, Scott, I, you and I have talked about this before when I was in executive search, I always said, I don't sell talent. I don't sell research. I don't sell strategy. I sell trust first yeah. and foremost. And if my clients trust me, then everything else is easy money. So it, it took me a long time to understand that m the value that I brought was the value of who I am uniquely compellingly, originally, like who I am. And when I, even now, when I get up on stage and I'm just me, I'm way more compelling than if I'm just like, hello, I'd like to talk to you about the hedonic treadmill and pluralistic <laughs> ignorance, right? So nobody cares. Like they want, they people buy into who we are as people. And so um, I think not being afraid to fly our freak flags. Look, there is a million billion miles between being loved and being seen. And I think a lot of people, if you ask them, were you loved as a child? They'd be like, yeah, I think, right? Like I was loved. I was cared for, I was provided for, if we were privileged enough to have that, that, that kind of stable home environment. I knew that if I did, had got good grades, if I was polite to the neighbors, if I cleaned the dishes after dinner, I'd be loved. But like, did I always feel comfortable that if I was who I really wanted to be and I was really seen for me, I'd still be loved? And I think a lot of us carry some of that baggage, that injured baggage from when we were children, and we don't want to put ourselves out there fully in that way. But the people who put themselves out there fully, I mean, you were just talking about Mace, Scott, at the beginning of this call, and the content that Mace puts up, why is it compelling? Because it's just like 100% authentic to who that person is. Amberly Lago, Kara Golden, Claude Silver, right? They think about the people who we enjoy spending the most time with Jesse Itzler, right? He's completely out there. You can talk about yeah. flying a freak flag. Like he flies <laughs> it up on a banana pole. Like it's, it's, it's amazing. So, so how do we, how do we figure out who we are? We have to make sure that as we are walking through life, we're bringing people with us who are the ones who, who, who truly see us. And when they see us starting to shrink away and hide, they sort of call us on that bullshit. Love it. Absolutely love it. All right. Uh, no one wants to hear me talk anymore. So we've got lots of questions. Uh, we are going to start with Scott in Illinois. Scott, you're up with LGO. Hey, good morning, LGO. It's a pleasure to, to meet you yes, Scott. I'm right up here. I know there's a lot of squares. You, this is a popular, uh, a popular day for you. Um, one quick thing before my question. So um, I retired from the military last September, and I had about a year before I actually left the service to, you know, make my decision and then certainly prepare. And funny thing, I don't remember what book I was looking for some books that would kind of help me transition. And uh, I completely, I don't know what I was typing in the Amazon search, but whatever I did, this was the first one. Amazing. Uh, and I, I tell you, that's the first book that I read in my transition journey. And I, I've probably bought 30 copies and more and given them away because it has certainly helped me think through like all the maturations that's going on in my head as I'm changing careers and thinking about what I want to do when I grow up. I mean, that's kind of the phrases that you hear a lot of military vets go through, but it's it's a hard time. But this was helpful and and I hope that it was helpful to the to the men and women I sent it off to. Oh, well, uh, thank so, you. And thank you for your service. No, thank you. I it was a huge help. Um but one of the things that struck me in Limitless, and it's early on in the book, which I really didn't believe until I actually started journaling about it and keeping track of it, you talked about how people can get all out of sorts. I think you said all out of kilter. Um, and we think it's because we're living such busy lives. 
when in fact, it's actually the transitions from one activity to another that are creating that stress. And I, I really pushed back on that in my own head. I'm like, I don't think so. I, I don't think she's right here. And then I, I literally tracked it for 30 days and I was shocked at how my emotions changed, you know, running from one meeting to another or one event to another, or, um, you know, just going from one speaking engagement to another. And it was astonishing. Are, are we completely missing the boat on the transition piece and so focused on our busy lives? I mean, this seems like it's a huge problem. Yeah, I think it is a huge problem. Um, before I answer that, I will say one of the fun things about Wonder Hell that you'll like is that the book itself is yellow. So I stuck with the limitless yellow. <laughs> you'll, you'll enjoy that. <laughs> um, little Easter egg for, 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 the, for, the, for the real limitless fans. Um, and thank you for that. Uh, I, 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 I really appreciate it. Uh, yes, I think, so what I talk about on Limitless is that we think that we are, we think we're exhausted because we're too busy, but we're actually exhausted from doing too much of what doesn't actually matter to us. And then the costume changes and the code shifting that we have to have in between. So if you're, you know, I think the examples I give in the book are like, you know, if, if, if you're a dentist and you're in like a candy making club, like the, the, the emotional energy that it takes to like be a different kind of person, right? If you're an oncologist who, you know, enjoys uh, going to a cigar club at night, like it's just, it's, it's trying to be two different people in your lives. And so we talk about, oh, I'm so exhausted. I'm so busy. I just need work-life balance. But really what we need is work-life alignment so that the values that we represent at work are the same values that we represent at home. So we're not sort of running between them. And so what I, what I, there's a, there's a chapter in Wonder Hell where I talk about this and it's, it's the whack-a-mole game. That's the ride for, for, for Wonder Hell. Because I think a lot of times we, we, we say yes to everything that comes in and then we, it sort of, it just goes to whatever fits on our calendar. And there was a moment, probably about 10 years ago, I was having lunch with a friend and she was like, I was talking about being exhausted. And she was like, well, tell me what you do. Tell me what your schedule looks like. And so I talked about, you know, the, can I pick your brain calls? We all get those. Can I pick your brain calls? And I used to say, I'm going to like schedule them for Monday at 9 AM. Perfect. Terrific. I'll get them all out of the way in the morning. And she's like, okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, what does the rest of your day look like? And then I was like, well, I'm the most creative in the morning. So I try to write from like nine to noon and then I have lunch meetings and then I practice, you know, keynote speeches and on and on. And she's like, well, wait, why are you doing those pick your brain calls then at 9 a.m., like first thing in the morning? And, and I realized in that moment that I was giving away my gold. And so, you know, Scott, you talk about the sort of in-between times that you can track and you can figure it out. But in addition to that, it's figuring out what your perfect schedule looks like. So I talk about a friend of mine in the book, Clay A. Bear, who talks about uh, the perfect calendar. And if, for example, your perfect calendar, like you are at your best, your most creative from nine to noon every day, that's when you should be scheduling your creative time. And if you then are ready for social, then you've got lunch meetings, and then you've got your, you know, calls in the afternoon. So how do you block at least a couple of days each week so that your very best is called upon for the things that you need your very best for? Ken will tell you, he's, uh, you know, asked me to, you know, to, to reach out, to have conversations. And I'm like, I'm happy to talk. I do those pick your brain calls now between six and 8 a.m. You can find me on my ERG. You can find me on my treadmill. You can find me running the Harvard Stadium. I'm happy to walk and talk. Studies show that we're actually more creative when we're moving our bodies. So happy to have a conversation. I'll be exercising. You can be exercising if you want. But I just started to, 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 to put better boundaries around my time so that I'm not just racing from one thing to another, but I'm actually doing what I do best when I need to be doing that thing and everything else sort of fits into places where that's the energy that I, I know I'm going to have in those days. Yeah. So I think what, what was helpful is we kind of took out the, the blocking technique where, you know, you're lining up meeting after meeting after meeting and started throwing in just bits of time to either walk around the building, go get a fresh, you know, uh, breath of air, whatever. And it was, it was a, a game changer. So yeah, and for you, that works amazingly. For some people, they want to be like, I want to go back to back to back and then have two hours of just chill, right? So everybody's different. And one of the things that I talk about in Wonder Hell is that we have these ideas like the 5 a.m. club or miracle mornings or, you know, whatever the thing is. Like I have a, I have a work wife. Her name is Rahaf Harfush. And we talk every 
Tuesday at 8 a.m. Because I'm a morning person. That's when I want to go get it. She lives in France. So it's the afternoon for her. And she's actually like an evening person. So for her, it's like the perfect timing. And she's like, screw the miracle morning. I want a miracle evening. Like that's when I'm most creative. So what I would say is like, if the 15 minutes in between works for you, I think that's incredible, right? It, 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 it will, it'll, it'll get the blood flowing. It'll get you, you know, you'll have some time to reflect on the meeting to prepare for the next one. Or if you're somebody who likes to bang them out, you can do that too. But the, what works for you works for you. Love it. Thank you so much. Randy Ostrow, Florida. You're up. Real quick, because I know we have limited time. Last April, you were on a call here and I'm looking at my notes and you said something, but we got cut short and it's highlighted. I'm a big fan of burning bridges. Please elaborate. <laughs> oh, yes. Actually, that conversation inspired a chapter, inspired the, the, the Ferrisville chapter in the book, where every time you go up and you see like the world from your new vantage point of just knowing more about yourself and knowing more about your environment, when you come back down, the people who were on the ride, maybe they should get off, right? Or maybe you want to bring different people on. So I'm not saying we got to like get bigger, better, and like have like fancier people around us. What I'm saying is there, there are going to be people in your life who have been there forever. And the only reason they're there is because they've been there forever. And some of those people love you and they don't want to see you get hurt. So they're like, oh, maybe you shouldn't try that new thing. Like maybe something's going to go wrong. Fine. The last time I lived in the same house as my parents, I was 17 years old and I used to bring the car back empty and, and the volume up on full, right? Like I didn't have a frontal lobe. So when I was like, I'm going to drop out of law school and go to join this presidential campaign, they were like, what are you crazy? And every single successive thing, leaving the Clinton administration, leaving the big firm, starting my own, selling that, deciding to you know write a book every time. Oh my God, is it going to be okay? So there are people in your life who love you. Then there are people in your life who are jealous and all they see with your rise is their own stagnation. And so you get a little like smiles in the front, but knives in the back type. And then the, the ones who are just scared, you run into them at Starbucks and they're like, oh, I don't know, man, you can't do that. That's too scary. And what they really mean is I can't do that. I'd be too scared. But for each of these people, they drop these little like kernels of cancer into your brain and you start wondering and worrying and get full of doubt and you're not sure. And then the first time something goes wrong, you're like, huh, maybe Joe from Starbucks was right. Maybe I should just quit this. And so I think we have to think about the people who we want to have in our lives who are additive to where we're going, who are putting wind in our sails, who are giving us momentum. And then also know that maybe there's some people who shouldn't be there anymore. Now, studies show that if you have people in your life who are obese, you are 57% more likely yourself to be obese. And they don't have to be people who live in your house or who you see every week. These are people who you are friends with on social media. So people don't even have to be physically proximate to you if they are stealing your attention. So if there's somebody who you see every single day on social media who has bad habits, it is much more likely that you are going to end up having those bad habits. They still influence you. They're still putting that in your brain. And so thinking about how you, I mean, being part of the outlier project, right? Coming to this every week, being part of this book club, getting the emails, being, um, seeing all the social media posts, that in the same way will help augment who you are and what you expect from yourself. So uh, if there is somebody in your life who is who, who was pulling you down, who was adding negativity, I would say burn that bridge. Unfriend them on social media. Maybe don't see them so often. And replace them with people who are, who replace them with people who don't let you settle for mediocrity, right? The ones who actually do truly see you and who know what you're made of. You talked to Jackie Summers, um, a, a, I think a month ago. And Jackie's a dear friend of mine and I talk about him in the book also. And there was a moment where Jackie and I were sitting in New York City and I was like, I'm just having trouble writing Wonder Hell. And he looked me in the eyes and he said, because you're not ready to tell the story you need to tell yet. What's holding you back from telling that story? And then he just stared at me in that way that I was like, <laughs> I got nowhere to go and I'm trapped until I answer this. So those are the kinds of people, the ones who don't let you settle for mediocrity that we need to replace the other people with. Amen. Thank you. Love it. Beware of Joe at Starbucks. That's what I got. Uh, <laughs> and Joe at right. Starbucks can be your sister or your brother or your mother or your exactly. best friend from high school. It can be anybody. Doug, we're staying in Florida. Doug, you're up. Yeah, what a, what a great exchange. Thank you, Scott. LGO, your energy is just 
phenomenal. And I am a proud freak flag waver. That's Woo! for sure. Amen. Amen. I um, read a Q&A with you in Forbes that resonated with me a little bit. And I'm gonna ask you a question if you can elaborate on it, which you were making a linkage between um, age and successful entrepreneurship. Yes. And I'm wondering to the degree of like self-awareness where that might factor into what your thoughts are on that topic, please. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I did a, um, I was on Good Morning America in January talking with uh, Robin Roberts about midlife career changes. And one of the things that I mentioned there also was that uh, we think that the next big entrepreneur is going to come out of like their garage or their dorm room at Harvard, right? It's going to be somebody who's dropping out and they're young. But it turns out that studies show that the most successful entrepreneurs are people that are in midlife in their 40s or beyond. So why is this? For some of them, it's because they have a little savings and they can self-fund a little bit. For some of them, it's because they can take a little time and 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 pursue this as a sort of side quest, as a as a side hustle, uh, before they go out and um and 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 really you know commit to it full time. So they can spend a little bit more time on the sort of funding or the 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 research and development. But really, by the time we get to our 40s and even into our late 30s we have a pretty good sense of what we do well and what we don't do well. So entrepreneurs in midlife know who to surround themselves with to bring out their best. Like when I started my last company, I spent, I can't tell you how many sleepless nights doing my invoices at two in the morning. Now, as you've noticed, I'm an author and a speaker. So I make my living with words. I don't make my living with numbers. So I would do those invoices at two in the morning because they were the very last thing I was doing. And I'll tell you something, Doug, they were mostly wrong. So I would get calls from my clients that were like, yeah, we got your invoice and we're confused about this number. And by the way, referring back to what I said earlier, if you're in the business of selling trust and you're selling your, sending your clients invoices that are wrong, then they start to wonder, well, if she got this wrong, what else is she getting wrong? <laughs> and one day my husband walked in, uh, it was like three in the morning. He's like, basically, I'm just going to curse. And he goes, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> it's like, you don't do math. You're not good at it. How much would it cost you to have somebody do those invoices? And I was like, I don't know, $40 an hour, $60 an hour. I don't know, $80 an hour. And he's like, what are you charging your clients? And I was like, $250 an hour. And he was like, um, let me do the most simple arithmetic ever. He goes, it's not even math, it's arithmetic. <laughs> and so that was the moment where I was like, okay, I need to surround myself with people who do smarter things. So if you're an entrepreneur and you know your highest and best use of your time is to go out and be selling you know, new clients or raising investment income or, or building a prototype, then you're not doing all the rest of the stuff that's, you know, as we talked about with Scott earlier, exhausting you. So, um, so, so, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing, it also has to do with understanding that failure is not finale, it's fulcrum. Because by the time you get to middle age, you failed a lot of times and you've survived all of them. So you know that you'll be able to get through it and you can take it as, 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 uh, as growth. This one, the last thing I'll say is something else I talk about in Wonder Hell is this idea of perfection. We think that, you know, we're going to get there, we're going to be perfect, we'll be successful, it'll be terrific. But we're not, right? There's no such thing as perfection. It's a sort of asymptotic curve where you never quite get all the way. You're like half the distance to the goal every single time. It turns out that there's three types of perfection. There's self-focused uh, uh, perfection. There's other focused perfection. And there's sort of socially prescribed per per perfection. Socially prescribed is obviously social media and what everyone else in the outside world thinks we should do. Other focused perfection is when we're like needling and micromanaging other people to be successful. So these first two are terrible, right? They're terrible. They lead to strained relationships. They lead to unhappy people all around us. But more than half of us fall into that type of perfectionism. Then there is the self uh, inflicted per perfectionism. And, you know, uh, uh, Joe will relate to this as, as an athlete, right? Those are the intrinsically motivated people. These are the ones who expect more of themselves and want to keep getting better and better and better. And one of the people I interviewed in the book, Jonathan Fields, who's a, a, an author and a, a very successful podcaster, he said when he was younger, when he was an artist, he, if he, if he, did a painting and it didn't look exactly like what he had in his brain, he would just tear the thing apart. But he had this expectation that it would be better than his level of skill really had any right 
to be like he had no right to think that he could be that good but he would still get so angry with himself and then over time he just put out a new book and he said you know what i'm most proud about this book is that in chapter four you know the third paragraph is a paragraph i couldn't have written 10 years ago i wasn't able to write a paragraph like that 10 years ago and now every time i see somebody doing something that i can't do yet i think isn't it amazing that i have the opportunity to spend the next 10 years getting even better and better and better at that thing and so when we're in middle age we have more of this sort of wisdom and 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 even though we're hungrier we also have patience knowing that it will come in time and that it's a process and we, we have more discipline around creating the habits that get us to the to, to the, the end goal well wow. makes perfect right. sense thank you we are going to try to get one two three four five questions oh my god okay speed rounds <laughs> i know we can do it uh and i'm going to put everybody in an awkward position right now because sunny in arizona who just had antonio hawk and Claude Silver on her podcast. Uh, you have to get LGO on your podcast. That's a like that's a no brainer. So anyway, I'm I'm making this marriage. I'm bridging this introduction. Sunny, you're up. Thank you. We appreciate you sharing your time. I will be quick, but in the spirit of the fact that growth never stops, I'm curious what you're doing currently to stretch yourself into a space of uncomfortability to continue the evolution? Yeah, uh, what I'm doing, well, I'm in wonder hell about wonder hell. <laughs> <laughs> So this is all a growth opportunity. Uh, what I'm doing, I was very, very sick in 2021. Like if you had asked me in March of 2021, if I was going to see March of 2022, I would not have taken that bet. Um, and what I'm doing to stretch myself is I'm telling that story on stage now as the beginning of the talk and then wrapping it up into, into the end of the talk. So I am, I am, I am inviting my audience to truly see me in a way that I have not yet. And it is terrifying every single time. But I will also say that I also am now getting standing ovations almost every single time and I didn't before. So I think it just shows that when people really, you really allow people to see you, they themselves feel seen. Thank you. I appreciate it. Love it. Chad, speed round. You're up. Chad in California. Wait for it. Once. LGO, this is awesome. Quick question. I took notice that uh, your undergraduate is UT um, Hookham. Oh, wait, this way. And I actually do some performing coaching for some basketball players out here, some youth student athlete basketball players. And my student athletes making his commitment announcement today. UT is one of them. Uh, UCLA, Kansas, and um, Syracuse, the other three. My question to you. I took notice, obviously, with your involvement in nonprofits. So what I want to do for these kids is get them to think beyond their sport, in this case, basketball. What advice might you share if you put yourself in a individual a student athlete who's transitioning into college, um, what they could do to get more involved in the community? So what I would say is I think that um, – that student athlete is probably going to hear, look, man, I got like practice. I got school. I got, um, figuring out how to live away from home. The first time that sounds really overwhelming. I'll get back to you on that. When I've made some money, I'll figure it out. I think what I would, and they're probably not wrong. I mean, you know, like every time my kids who are 18 and 20 tell me they're busy, I'm like, busy with what? Like, can I introduce you to what it's like being an adult? Right. But, um, but what I would say is I would probably put emphasis on, the role modeling that that guy has like he probably had role models in his life right he's obviously got you as a role model but in terms of other players other coaches family members community members whoever it is i would remind him that even if people aren't talking to him every day they are watching him every day and i think i would probably tell him that it takes absolutely no additional time for him to remember that there are other young people watching him and probably the best thing that he can do to help others find a better path is to probably be more um, vocal about what he's going through, how hard he's working, what it entails, what he's sacrificed and, and, and what it means to him to, to achieve and just sort of live more out loud about it. Awesome. Thank you. Mark Holden, you're up. 
Thank you for your energy. This is an amazing experience. Uh, I love that you mentioned hedonic treadmill in my line of work at personal finance. I basically ask people why they're spending money on massive things. I'm, you know, that 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 idea uh, allows me to help them uh, understand not buying too much just for the sake of happiness spikes. But in any case, uh, I'll, I'll keep the question tight. Um, I have a couple of daughters, nine and 12 years old. Uh, does this book address, you know, a younger audience as well? Do you think there's like a kind of a floor in terms of uh, readability for audience for your new uh, book, Wonder Health? Well, I would say that my 18-year-old son just started reading it last week, and his response was, it's not half bad, mom. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, I mean, I think I think Wonder Hell is probably right for all of your clients. I think uh, Limitless is probably the book for somebody who's trying to figure out who they want to be and what they want to be in the world. So it's sort of Wonder Hell kind of follows Limitless. So I'd start there. Thank you. Perfect. All right, Tom. Oh, you. Hey, Tom. Love Daily Dober on Instagram. <laughs> I have a Doberman right, I post every follow, day on Instagram. Uh, LGO on Instagram. You're miss you're missing out on a lot of Doberman Pincher stuff. And so. now a new Brussels Griffin. Yes, congrats. <laughs> I, I think my question was uh, along the lines with Doug. You, I have seen you on different news shows talking about ageism in the workplace. And it's such a weird thing to hear right now. Oh my God, we have all these job openings. Oh, nobody wants to work. This is happening. But yet ageism is still here and we're not filling those gaps. What do you, what do you see in the workplace and those things? Is, is there a shift? Are we trying to find old people again? <laughs> well, I think, uh, I, I think that... I think that ageism is real. I think it's real. I think it's always going to exist. But I think that there are a lot of things that we can do if we're applying, if we're looking um, uh, to make that shift. And and I would say, you know, the 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 least uh, effective way to look for a job is to look at the want ads, right? To look online, to look at postings. The most effective way is to network, is to have conversations, is to do informational interviews. It's always been that way. It's still that way now. It's always going to be that way. So if Scott called me up and said, Laura, I know you're hiring. I've got this great guy, Tom. What am I going to do? I'm going to look at your resume. I'm going to have a conversation with you because I trust Scott. If you're applying cold, it's the same exact resume, but I may not even see it, right? So I think I think having those conversations and just being able to, just being able to have a conversation where uh, uh, the person who was vouching for you can tell a little you know, something about who you are and why you're worth seeing. I think that that removes so much of the ageism. Yeah. Yep. Great. Thank you. An another thing to get rid of ageism is lose your Yahoo or your Hotmail uh, email. Just to or don't thing. put Atari in my, uh, yeah, in my, yeah, exa in my exactly. LinkedIn post. <laughs> yes. just, a su just a suggestion. All right. We always, nothing better than ending with a beautiful British accent from our favorite actress, Isabel, you're up. You are our cleanup hitter with LGO. There's the pressure. Look at me blushing, I'm blushing. <laughs> I, I, I can't wait till I can attend these calls without cooking. I, I don't like cooking and I'm always feeding my child when I'm on these calls. But anyway, um, really quick question, which is all of the things you've talked about, I, I completely relate to, so thank you. I struggle with all of them still too. So I'm I'm inherently not patient. I people please. I do all of the above, even though I've spent my entire career failing. So as an actress, you're you're failing all the time and you're learning all the time, you're growing all the time, you're having to push those boundaries all of the time. When you feel yourself falling or 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 tipping into those sorts of habits, uh, what what's the first thing that you do? That's a good question. I, I think that when I feel myself doing that, I, I I always ask myself whenever I'm people pleasing, am I the most important person for this for this job, for this task? One of the best pieces of advice I ever got in my life was you're just not that important. And what the person who was giving me that advice meant was you're just not that important to all these things you've said yes to, but you are that important to other things. Like if you weren't feeding your kids right now, what would they do? You are that important there. But there's probably a lot of other things in your inbox and in your to-do list on your calendar that maybe 
maybe somebody else is better at doing. And so I think a lot of times we say yes, because we're the most proximate heartbeat and not necessarily because we're the best person for the role. So I think sort of that's just one question to one of the multiple emotions that, that, that you're experiencing. And I obviously talk about the rest of them in the book, but I think just taking that moment and pausing and just asking yourself, like, well, why am I doing this? And what if I didn't do it? Would it be okay? Like, would people survive if 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 I didn't do this thing? I think that that's um, I think it's a better way to put ourselves in a place where we're actually doing the stuff that matters, as we talked about with Scott, that actually matters to us. Because otherwise, we're just always in that in between of racing, and we're sort of we're not enough for anybody, and we're certainly mm-hmm. not enough for ourselves. Thank you so much. One of the coolest things about the Outlier Project and having people like LGO on is it's so humbling because I learned so much stuff. Hedonistic treadmill, did not know that before this call. Uh, asymptotic, is that, I don't even know what that is. I'm, I'm gonna have asymptotic to curve. It. Curve, I'm <laughs> yeah. gonna have to Google that. That's, that's good, that's it's good mad. shit. I love it, I love it. <laughs> LGO, you are the best. Everybody go by Wonder How. Uh, pre-order it, uh, get the jump on it. Uh, let's help make this another bestseller uh, for LGO uh, and make sure that you leave a review uh, after you bought it um, because that's super, super helpful. Um, LGO, I, I cannot thank you enough. I mean, we could have you on constantly uh, and we continue to learn every single time. So uh, I know how precious your time is. I, I really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. And um, we're doing a whole bunch of pre-order bonuses also. So if people order it through wonderhell.com, um, you can get access to the Limitless course. There's, if you buy 50 books for your team, I jump in and I do a, um, I'll do a, a virtual. There's all sorts of like, you can get keynotes for way discounted prices. But if you have ordered it on Amazon while we're on this call, that's cool too. Just send me your, your uh, just send me your uh, receipt and we'll just put you in for all the bonuses also. And so my email is, LGO at limitlesspossibility.com. And I'll just type that real quick. So yeah, you can reach out to me, find me on social at Hey LGO. And if you have any trouble, just let me know. But thank you so much, Scott. This has been super fun. Thank you, Kathy, for organizing us also. Thank you. This has been incredible.